Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special stream with one of my favorite streamers and artists. Hi, Sam. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it is going great. And we have a lot to talk about today, which I love. So today, if you're just joining us, uh, we are doing a little bit of like science talk and like theory as well as some application, which I think is going to be really fun. Um, hello to everyone in chat. Good to see you. Clarissa is here. Annika Oliver. Uh, nice to see you. Let us know where you are watching from. Sam, where are you creating from? I'm creating from LA County. Long That's Beach. right. So Cowboys here. Um, all right. So let's hop in. Let's take a look at some of your work. We have a ton to talk about today. So let's just get started. Sam, tell us about you. Yeah, if you guys don't know me, I've been around Adobe quite a bit. I do a lot of fantasy art, concept art. Uh, primarily character work. If you want to check out my work, I think my Instagram is currently the most updated. I think Annika also put my Behance in the chat. But yeah, a lot of monsters and fantasy characters and this kind of thing. So we're going to be doing some of that today. Yes, I'm so excited. Uh, and I know we're talking about some theory, so I'm excited. I've seen a bunch of your work. I'm excited to get in your brain and kind of understand how you get to these concepts, which is exactly what Adobe Live is all about. If you haven't watched before, we're here bringing on artists and creatives to show you their process and help you understand how you can create, uh, maybe by stealing some tips from them. Uh, they're not stealing, we're giving them freely uh, and implement them into your workflows. Uh, so Sam, Talk a little bit about what we are going to be doing today. Yeah, so today I wanted to talk about shape language and silhouette for character design. I can put this away. We can go into that a little bit here. So before we jump into Fresco, I got a little slideshow presentation yes, for everybody. That's right, everybody. Take out your notebooks, get ready, take some screenshots. So shape language is essentially the the feeling and the the implication we get from seeing different um characters and different shapes that make them up so a lot of times if we see like a very friendly character someone who's non-threatening um we'll see them made up of circles oftentimes if we see a character who's really like strong reliable dependable sturdy a lot of times they're made up of rectangles and shapes like that um, if you see a character who's like powerful and dynamic, possibly dangerous, uh, cunning, things like that, you'll often see them made up of triangles and angles. And this is largely, you know, there's a lot of kind of psychology that goes into this, but this is largely just because of our experience as humans with nature. Like if we see something that's curved with smooth edges, we're going to see it as non-threatening. If we see something that's very wide and um, rectangular, we know that that's probably very stable. You know, if you're moving it around, it has probably a lot of stability to it. Um, if we see something that's very sharp and angular, like thorns, you know, with uh, triangles, we know that's probably something we don't want to be around. And what's cool is this in art in general and design translates from the real world, like you're saying. So we call these indexes uh, in design is that they indicate something, right? So like smoke indicates fire, right? And from a physical sense, things that are sharp have pain, right? They are negative to us that then we associate that triangle or that sharpness with the physical pain. And so it's really cool to see you translate uh, kind of one sense to another, right? We're translating everything to a visual sense, which I think is really cool to see this breakdown and understand like how these feel tangibly, we can create with that and illustrate it to get those same emotions. Yeah, for sure. And this is all, there's so many things that go into character design. And this is just one of like the many tools we have. So if you think of different characters that, you know, you grew up with iconic characters, here's some like iconic uh, cartoon characters. The idea is for silhouette, we're kind of shifting into silhouette here, is that when you build these up with different shapes, that they'll have a sort of graphic iconic read, you know, like a logo would, or just like any sort of solid graphic design that it reads very simply. So here's a bunch of characters you may recognize. And I think good design really does let you kind of identify that character at a glance. And then uh, these are some video game characters from the game Overwatch, if anyone knows that. But silhouette is very important in video games. I mean, really in understanding any character just from a, a glimpse at them. But video games, it's very important because if you're seeing an enemy character from across the map, it's important to identify exactly, oh, that's this really strong tank character. Um, I know how to you know, react to that now, or this is a very dangerous quick character. I have to be you know, on my guard. 
So video games are really conscious of this when they're designing characters that they have to be very identifiable. And if you have a cast of characters that's like 20, 30, 40, you know, League of Legends has like, I think hundreds, um, you really have to kind of be conscious of the shapes that you're making them up so you can just see them, you know, when they're, when they're very small on the screen. And um, another thing I want to point out with Silhouette is oftentimes when you see cast of characters, in, in movies and animated series, it's the same thing, just to give those characters contrast to each other, to give them like personality contrast, visual contrast. So these are a bunch of silhouettes from Toy Story. And you can tell it's a successful design because at a glance you can see these all look different from each other and you could probably identify which character is which. And I love that when you talked about, right, the triangles being like sharp, dangerous, whatever, I love that all of these are like round and blobby except for Zerg and the Prospector. And specifically the little notch in the prospector's hat, giving him that like extra little, cause he's very blobby, like getting that extra little like villain spike. I love looking at this slide and like understanding that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if someone would notice that. Cause when you see these, they're all like really soft rounded shapes minus yes. those two. Whereas when you look at the Overwatch characters, there's a lot more <laughs> danger to them <laughs> yeah. because, yes. because of the nature of what those characters do. So I thought I'd show a couple characters just real quick, talk about them. We got a couple Monsters Inc. characters. And you can see the contrast between the two characters is very clear. Um, you'll see this all the time in shows where they're trying to make the two or three main characters all have a good variety. So we have the big rectangular character. Um, we have Mike on the right who's made up of circles. Uh, we get the sense that Mike's probably, you know, not nearly as strong with his tiny limbs. He's got these kind of stick figure limbs, whereas... Um, I think it's James. He's very stocky and all his limbs are very thick and, and rectangular. And then we have uh, the characters from Up. I actually forget their names, but um, the old man is, you know, he's he's rectangle. He's very like uh, stubborn. It's kind of that like unmoving and that kind of lends itself to his attitude in, in the movie. And then we have the boy who's he's pretty much just an egg shape, but, you know, he's very friendly, very soft, very uh, non-threatening. And um, even like his patches on his sash are just circles, whereas we can see some rectangles in the belt and the glasses of this, uh, the man. And it's it's all these like little shapes and things you're considering yep. when you're creating even his these characters. fingers like his fingers are rectangular, whereas the kids are very like rounded, which I think is such an interesting like design choice in the same world to be like, OK, here's a finger. It's like they're different fingers for the characters because they need to inform different things. Yeah, exactly. And. I think um, I don't it's been so long since I've seen the movie, but he has this little, I think, bottle cap that's, you know, rounded. Yep. And I think that isn't that like a callback to kind of his softer side, um, the the part of him that's a little bit more. Yes. Uh, like Ooh, an emotional connection. Comparison. Character and now, design right there. I don't know if that's intentional, but it would make sense. Like there's this little, you know, rounded part that kind of hints to that softer side of him. Ooh, I love that. So just things to consider when you're making characters. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about was visual hierarchy. So we have silhouette, which is the overall impression of the character. Um, we have the shapes, you know, the, the shape language are using squares, rectangles, whatever it might be. But there's also something to consider, and this is, I think, a pretty common design principle, which is having like a big, medium, small read. So not all the shapes are going to compete for the same level of attention and contrast, but you're going to have some shapes that are the dominant shapes. Then you'll have a set of secondary shapes and then tertiary shapes. So for Mega Man, I thought this was a cool design of Mega Man. We see these kind of biggest shapes are um, his boots, his arms, and his head. But even among these, the boots are clearly the biggest, and the arms and the head are kind of the secondary shape. And I kind of like it because he's this big triangle shape, but um, we have like the biggest shape, the sturdiest one at the bottom, which, you know, I think gives it a lot of stability. Secondarily, we have like the shoulder pad and these bits of armor, and then... Um, there's kind of, I wouldn't say these are necessarily smaller, but it's this clear separation of shapes and kind of one, a read that goes from one to the other. And then the lastly, we have all these detail lines, all these like little, little lines and dots and things that um, just kind of add a bit more to the overall design. But if you simplify it, this is kind of what you see. And when you're designing characters like that, do you think about like scale with that hierarchy that like as they scale further away, like the lower hierarchy goes away? Like if you're illustrating that character really small, that it's like, cool, lowest hierarchy is just not going to get illustrated all those little details. Uh, or is that something that like th that you'll see in animation? Yeah, definitely. Like 
if I were to make a um, an animation or a graphic novel or something like that, and the character's off in the distance, you're gonna rely on those primary shapes, those big shapes that make up their silhouette. But if they have all these little dots and lines, like you're not gonna be, you know, zooming in. You're not gonna have like a giant canvas where it's like I gotta get all these details. And yep. you just kind of let those fade away. And the strength of the silhouette and the shapes, like we talked about with the video game characters, will really let that character still read iconically. And then um, I thought I would show it with one more character here where just like, let's take a piece of his armor. You know, you can just break this down to certain sections. So let's take his shoulder pad here. We have this big shape that makes up the whole thing. And then we kind of have these like secondary shapes with the little, uh, the little fin at the top, the little circular thing, these little pieces that are kind of hanging off of it. And then finally, we have these little like detail lines, a little rectangle, these little kind of dashes and dots. But altogether, it has a, a nice read. It's not like everything is competing for your attention. So these are some things I think we're going to go forward with and do some characters and keep all these principles in mind from shape language to silhouette um, and visual hierarchy. Yes, let's draw some stuff. Um, what are we going to be working in today? I know in the past you've streamed a lot of Photoshop, but I think we're going somewhere a little bit different today. Where are we going? Yeah, so I'm going to be working in Fresco today. Um, I really like Fresco for sketching. It's kind of my favorite way to draw. Uh, I think I think there was a long time where I did digital art, but I really love drawing in my sketchbook because of the control, but you don't have all the control Z and transform options and everything that makes digital so flexible. But when I started using the iPad in Fresco, I just it felt like like a digital sketchbook, like what I wanted. So when I'm doing line work and I'm doing thumbnailing and sketching, which is what we're going to be doing today, I work in Fresco, and then I oftentimes will do more of my rendering and painting process in Photoshop. So what I wanted to talk about real quick is um, when we were talking about the shapes and everything, I want to show a quick example, just thumbnailing, how you can kind of do the same character or the same idea with different shapes. So we have the more rounded character on the left. You can see I sloped his shoulders a bit more. We have a more boxy character in the middle a little bit more broad shoulders and the torso is a little bit more, you know, rectangular. Um, even in the limbs, you can see with the legs and the arms, I'm going a little bit more uh, angular for this one on the right. And the overall shape of it is more triangular. So you can use these on the a big scale, like the overall character has kind of a triangular shape to them. Or you can just use it, you know, smaller areas kind of indicating that. Like you mentioned, Andrew, with the fingers, even... Uh, the character and up, his fingers were blocky. You know, you can kind of go down to that level too. Yep. It's so, interesting to see just the way that you're connecting those hinge points differently, that it's like rounded hinge, like square hinge, and then sharp hinge uh, just on those like element details. I think that's really cool. Yeah. So I wanted to do a cast of characters with the time we have left where I'm going to try see how much we can get done, but I'm going to do three characters and I'm going to do a hero a sidekick and a villain. Ooh, so, fun. Okay. And we're going to try to utilize each one of these shapes that we talked about and see if we can do that. Now, there's so many ways you could do it because, like, you can do like a really tall hero and, a, you know, short. We're going to go for that too. That sort of picks our like um, tall, short, big, small, that kind of thing. So, you know, we could have a character. It's like the hero and maybe they're tall and kind of more lanky. And we could, we could go anything for these. Now, typically you think the hero, oh, rounded shapes. Maybe the sidekick is more the dependable, reliable. So maybe they're rectangular shapes and maybe they're even like more squat and small. Um, and then we could have a villain who's going to be, you know, maybe they're in between in height, but they're, they're a lot more angular and they, you know, they got more immediate more horns. Yeah, exactly. Villains are so easy to do because you just put spikes everywhere. But um, it's fun to mix it up too because you could totally. You could try to do a villain that's made up of rounded shapes. Like these aren't rules where everyone has to be something. It's just a tool to use when you're doing these characters. So we could do like a, a small hero, um, you know, and then we could have like maybe a big kind of guardian type of sidekick. And then the villain, you know, the villain could be anything. He could be a little goblin who's all magical. He could be this kind of <laughs> tall, you know, uh, sinister sorcerer type um so what i was thinking you know this is a lot of brainstorming so we don't have a lot of time for this so i kind of came up with a little bit of a premise Love before that. the stream which is we're gonna have this little gnome character 
And I don't know what her name is going to be, but okay. she's going to be our hero. And if chat wants to give a name as we develop this, if you're feeling something, let me know. Yes, chat, put your suggestions in there and I will tally the, the votes. So I will start doodling her and uh, let you guys know a little bit about what I had in mind. So I'm thinking she's an engineer. She's a little uh, gnome engineer. She's a savant with, you know, constructing things and building like mechanical devices. And uh, she is kind of ahead of her time. She's really good at it, but she needs precision parts. So she can't always build everything because the tech isn't there, but she's going to have this blacksmith. And I'm thinking this is kind of, we'll, we'll doodle her out really quick. But she's this little, little gnome. And then there's this blacksmith who's a sort of sidekick companion. And um, the idea is that little story I came up with is that she needs these parts, you know, to further her engineering. So she traveled this long way to meet this blacksmith who is supposed to be the best blacksmith ever. And uh, if anyone can construct these parts she needs, he's the one. So I'm thinking he's going to be this big guy. He's going to be the rectangle of the group. She's going to be made of beefy. Yeah. And this is, I like to kind of just really doodle out, you know, very rough ideas and rough shapes um, in the beginning, because I like to see how they compare to each other before I really start detailing one of them. Oh, it's interesting when you're working with like a crew, being able to not only care about the individual character design, but like the group design of how do they relate to each other? What kind of contrast can you play with? What kind of compliments and create almost like this, like brand by using a similar visual language with each person uh, or creating some contrast with each person. Yeah, exactly. And I think it just makes for an interesting cast of characters. Like the ones we talked about, there's just a lot more variety there and they, they complement each other. Like the, the abilities and the skills they have, the faults and the strengths that they have all kind of contrast and it just makes for more variety and more interest. Yep, and Wade Acuff in chat is saying, finally a time for short kings and queens to shine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is short king summer, uh, if you guys don't know. Uh, so we have some suggestions for names that I love. We have Nomi Nomi. We have Elfie, <laughs> Molly MacGyver, <laughs> Ferrier the Smithy, uh, and Seven. Uh, I, I thought it said Steven at first, and I was like, that's a move. Uh, so I like those chat. If you have a favorite out of those, let me know. Uh, and we can pick a name for that. My personal favorite, Molly MacGyver. Uh, but chat, let <laughs> us know what you like and we can come up with a name. Molly MacGyver is pretty solid. I gotta it say. really is, especially for a fantasy. I feel like having the alliteration is always, uh, kind of just like rolling off your tongue. So I'm thinking, you know, she's going to have like these rounded shoulder pads. I'm just really thumbnailing it out. And I, I always find if I don't thumbnail, if I get too into it right away, like, oh, I want to detail her face or I have an idea for this or that, I always end up regretting it. And whenever I stick to like doodles, you know, stay zoomed out, stick to just doodling it super roughly, I'm thinking she has these rounded poofy, like ponytail type thing or not yep. ponytail, pigtails. Um, I always just find the result is so much better. So if I can be as thumbnailing and graphic as possible from the beginning, it always yields better results for me. So that's what I'm trying to stay to here but you know just using these kind of circular shapes and and i like watching all of us uh if we were paying attention pop quiz chat uh i love that you are doing the hierarchy now that like watching your illustration process you're now in like the mid zone of like shoulder pads the little belt is there and it starts to just develop that sketch by starting with the big hierarchy and then working your way down i think it's really interesting to see yeah like i just want a a basic silhouette like if we were to shade this in you know it's a pretty simple shape um and we could add to this and, and modify it of course like maybe she has something off her back or you know things hanging down but the the general shape is kind of there so we'll move on we'll leave this very simple um and we'll see if we can get the other two to kind of compare first so this is going to be the blacksmith and what i was thinking for him is she travels all this long way she has her own beginning story she travels all the way to the town or city of this blacksmith where he's supposed to be. And it's a long journey. And when she gets there, um, I'm thinking that the town was just attacked by the villain. So we'll, we'll mm. place him here for now. And in, in trying to defend the town, because the blacksmith, he makes all these weapons, right? So he's, uh, he's kind of an experienced swordsman, too. 
Uh, he's a very big guy, so he's he's strong and he can fight. But in the in the battle, um, I'm thinking somehow the sorcerer did something where he damaged his arm and he ended up losing his arm. So when she gets there, she's saying, you know, I need you to make these parts. I heard you were the best, but he's not having it. He's like, I'm done. My days of blacksmithing are over. I don't want to talk to anyone. He's in a he's in a funk because he's like, I lost my arm and, you know, I can't blacksmith like this. Um, and then she does this thing where she spends maybe months, you know, she's like, you're too, you're too skilled not to do this. We're going to get you back. And she builds him like a mechanical arm with her Ooh. engineering prowess. So I'm thinking he has like this, not robot arm, but just like this kind of clockwork mechanical arm um, that she built for him. We love a team up. So then that kind of reinvigorates him. You know, they become allies because of this. And um, I'm thinking maybe that I don't really have this story figured out, but maybe they team up to to stop the sorcerer from continuing to terrorize, you know. Yes. It's a very like kind of like ratchet and clank kind of dynamic. Uh, if you ever play that, it's like an old Dreamcast PlayStation game. Uh, that's kind of the... Yeah, the, the partner dynamic duo. And I could see, I like the story. I could see her like making multiple arms for different scenarios. And like, that's like the dynamic they have is she's like got all the arms in a backpack. Oh. And he's like, I need this. And she likes, you know, whips something up and snaps it in. And then he has like a grappling hook or whatever. Uh, that's a fun little dynamic to like play on their strengths and weaknesses together. Oh, that's, yeah. I've never played Ratchet and Clank, but um that that's a super cool idea i like that i was just thinking he has this arm that now he can blacksmith again and it's capable but that would be so cool if he had like an arsenal of like yeah i need my my grappling hook arm so we can get yep. up this cliff very i see like the power rangers transformation of like grappling arm <laughs> <laughs> full sailor moon vibes yeah yeah for sure i like that um also it makes you kind of think about personality so for for the personality when I was thinking of these, and this is actually kind of a lesson I want to talk about too, is I've had a lot of times where I, I will draw characters, but it's just because I'm, I just want to draw a character, but I found that I get so much more satisfaction and um, I get so much more invested in a character when I come up with these little stories and like they have these backgrounds. So I'm thinking she's this really bubbly character. She's, she's super ambitious. So she's always excited about her next project. And she's like, just w almost way too optimistic about things like, oh, we can do this and we can make anything happen. And like, oh, I want to do this project. And she's just like, it gets her into trouble maybe. Like maybe that's one of her faults where she's a little bit naive, uh, but she's just really optimistic and, and ambitious. And this character to kind of contrast that, you know, I'm thinking maybe he's older, he's more of a curmudgeon. Yeah, he's um, been through life. He's got the stories. He's mad about his arm. Yeah, exactly. So she, you know, they kind of play off each other in that way, but he's also very stoic and, and uh, loyal. Um, so I, I thought, I think when I kind of have characters with personality dynamics, I just get so much more invested in them. And yes. it gives you this room to take that shape language, to take that idea and like the visual representation of who they are and do that in a much more intentional way. And I, I just find that I enjoy characters, um, like 10 times as much when I have all these elements yep. in, so in my head. We're getting to villain. Yep. What's the story for our villain? I don't really know. Um, okay. Having Chat, a, if you have suggestions, let us know. Having a villain that has like, you know, a compelling element about them, I think is really, really fun. Cause you could totally just go, he's an evil sorcerer. He wants to take over the world. But to me, it doesn't, it doesn't do it as much. I'm not quite as invested. You know, I like having villains that have like, interesting weaknesses or quirks or yes. even maybe things that are like you know they're they're not not that they're misunderstood but like there's some relatable aspects possibly yes they're like you're kind of rooting for them for a second and then you're like no like lots of yeah uh i mean really all the toy story villains except zerg uh like have that kind of the prospector is like oh you were like left and deserted that it is that kind of i'm rooting for you but i can't root for you because you're evil yeah exactly like it's like you almost you almost had the sympathy and the, there is an element of like relatability but still you want them you know you know what they're doing is bad and yep um, and i love you're, that you're just playing with like sharp shapes right now it's kind of just yep. like yep like angle here angle there 
Yeah. And it's good to have some idea of like, what could these angles be? Like these angles are shoulder pads. This angle is a collar. Um, I'm thinking he, he could have like this little kind of robe draping. That's, you know, let's keep it angular and pointy. And then like maybe a cape, we could even make that sort of angular. Love a good cape. Um, yeah. Who doesn't cape is <laughs> it's hard for me not to fit capes into character design. Maybe it's a crutch. I'm not sure. Oh, interesting. Wade is saying villains don't know that they're villain. So playing up the aspect that they have something to root for is always interesting. That's that's very interesting from a writing perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did a animated project with a couple people, a sort of collaborative project. And it the first one was about a villain. And it was this necromancer character in a D&D world. But we gave him a, like, a lot more background, personality. Like he's a... He's a and he's a cook hobbyist like he likes cooking and baking but you know he has to do his necromancing because the the dark lord who is his boss and sometimes he just wants to do his own hobbies so he has the, it's kind of you know it's pretty silly but it's, it was fun to come up with this like necromancer who's not just evil but he has all these other things about him that he uh insecurities and hobbies and things he likes to do yep uh and someone a uh, rin in chat is saying uh can the villain be kind of ghostly like made out of some ash smoke Ooh. uh i like that Ooh, and the hero that's awesome the hero makes a vacuum attachment to help defeat them that's kind of cool <laughs> there's some kind of like yeah. aura very like ghostbusters luigi's mansion vibe <laughs> for sure it'd be really cool if like somehow uh were we going with molly i like i kind of like molly molly mcgyver i think let's it was, do it right? yeah um, if Molly has constantly coming up with like inventions that thwart his spells somehow. Ooh, so that's fun. And maybe that's where their conflict comes from. She has a grudge against him because of what she did, you know, to her best friend and also his town and everything. She finds out about it then. But um, he sees her as a threat because every time he's making some headway with his, you know, plans, she, uh, uses her skills to kind of thwart it Ooh, and even like the relatable aspect of maybe he is like trying to learn to be like a master wizard or warlock or whatever and he's trying these new spells and trying to like conjure new stuff and then she thwarts it and he's like i'm just trying to learn like i'm, <laughs> I'm trying to like practice these new spells yeah i like that like he's maybe not super accomplished yet but he's yeah, trying yeah, to yeah He's an up and comer in the sorcerer world, but she, <laughs> yes. she's not letting him get the glory that all the other sorcerers in his class got. Yes, I love that. N Nora saying the villain's name, the spell checker. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's fun. So a lot of times I like to kind of stop doodling and think of, okay, what's the scale of all these characters? Because I got a little bit out of range with this, but maybe I want to make them thinner. Ooh, um, I don't like him being this much taller than the blacksmith. I, w I want the blacksmith to kind of be physically intimidating to the villain, but the villain may be taller overall because of his elaborate costume. But, you know, physically, he's a bit smaller. So I think that's like interesting, that. again, to see the relation of characters that it's, you know, we want the tank to feel like a tank, whereas if the villain is four feet taller, it's not going to be as intimidating and like kind of rambunctious. Yeah, and like he could maybe challenge uh, and intimidate the villain physically, but the villain has these powers, you know, it'd probably just nullify him somehow. So kind of having like this this good balance between... We're making power. a whole combat system here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of the very rough thumbnail. Now we could go a bit more in depth. Um, I don't know if anyone has a character they'd really like to see developed, but I think Ooh. we have a we have a bit more time. So I'll start working on these a little bit more, developing the thumbnails a bit more because they're not quite to my liking. But if chat has a character they really like to see us go furthest with, uh, let me know. Chat, let us know. So we have uh, the first one is Molly MacGyver. Uh, we don't have a name for the second one, but I'm just going to call him Chunk because I think it's fun. <laughs> uh, and then our third one, the spell checker, uh, which one would we like to see kind of developed more into a character? Um, ooh, he's got like Baymax Panda vibes. <laughs> Baymax Panda. <laughs> I don't know why I got that. Like <laughs> something about the eyes are very like Panda-y. Um <laughs> 
chat let us know which one uh molly who else do we want to see and hello george welcome to the stream good to see you here we are creating some characters based on shape language which is really fun i like the idea that if he has like some panda-esque design to him and then it just indicates his soft side that you don't usually see kind of like yes. kind of like we were talking about with the character from up he's he's a nice guy but yeah he he's just a big teddy bear the on the inside yeah he lives in a rough world you know it doesn't let you it's not conducive yeah, yeah. to showing your soft side he's not grumpy the world is me <laughs> exactly <laughs> like clint eastwood take <laughs> <laughs> um so it looks like chat probably wants to see molly developed out a little bit more uh i kind of agree i think that would be fun and it's a fun character uh that again we can do as much or as little detail uh as we kind of develop out yeah and we can jump you know from character to character I, i'm not sure how much we'll be able to get done uh by the end of this but i really do like to keep it as loose as i can in the beginning just shapes that like these are kind of visual notes um like i'll make these little marks here and it's just to tell me, like, maybe he's got tools, you know, kind of hanging down from his belt. Um, he's got all these kind of blacksmith tools. And so usually like are those kind of just notes for you in the future that, like, when I go into detail, there's a thing here, a thing here, a thing here, um, as you kind of iterate on these? Yeah, like, when I do a little bit more finish lines, I'm like, oh, I indicated that I want him to have a hammer here. And uh, it's just kind of these things, like, oh, yeah, I, I got to remember to explore this idea because... I will often forget otherwise. Yep. And when you're working, so we have these sketches here and kind of develop and working through them. When you get to a, a next step point, do you work on a completely new layer or do you just keep building and iterating on these sketches? Yeah. What I might do is duplicate this layer if I kind of like this thumbnail and I like the idea and then keep thumbnailing on that, you know, that duplicated layer. Yep. Just just in case I got rid of anything that I liked. Sometimes my very initial sketches, I lose something and I look at it and I'm like, oh, actually, I want to want to get back to that idea. I sort of lost it. Uh, but when I start drawing the actual lines, I do that on a new layer. Yep. I love his apron is giving like Jeep vibes or like train vibes. Like it has such <laughs> like a like weight to it. Yeah, that's perfect. I think that works for him. Yeah, let's uh, let's work on Molly a bit because she is our hero. And she's looking uh, pretty pretty loose right now. So we'll, we'll kind of work on that a bit. Um, I think I want to get her face down. So we'll start drawing on that. So all of this sketch, this like one layer, I do, I don't mind kind of just drawing on a single layer, but there would be a point where I like the design. I think everything's solidified. And I'm like, all right, let's, let's work this up cleanly now that I know what I want. But this is still the sort of, let's figure it out layer. And this is like, again, if you have ever taken an art or drawing class, it is sketch super loose and really soft. And then as you see the lines that are working, draw them in darker. Uh, yeah. And then it like everything fades away. And then it looks like this, like, I like barely sketched. I just like drew these awesome lines. You're like, there's a lot of sketching, but the darker points start to just shine through. Yeah. And that's kind of what i like about fresco is that's how i draw in my sketchbook and uh it, it's kind of the same thing here i'll i'll erase it a little bit and just lighten it up kind of like you would with a kneaded eraser oh, that's interesting and then i just kind of you know darken it down a bit more so on my clean line layer i don't necessarily do that i'll i'll make a completely new clean layer but this is my sort of thumbnailing layer where yeah i just uh erase it a bit and then put it back in and do that over and over until I get the shapes I want. That's so interesting to not use like opacities and layers. You're just like, yeah, just like one eraser scrub over it and then draw on your darker lines and you're good to go. Uh, that's a really interesting technique. I've never seen that before. Yeah. And it just sort of makes it feel like I'm sketching in a sketchbook. And, you know, it's what I'm used to all those years when I was first drawing, um, just like in graphite. So. Yep, and Marsha is asking familiar. in chat, no eraser. Uh, at this point in the process, no eraser. Just keep sketching, keep adding, keep drawing. And then again, darker will pull things out. Eventually we'd probably use some eraser stuff, but in this section, there's no wrong answers. You can kind of just sketch and explore and let your imagination run wild. Yeah, the eraser is just really used to kind of lighten it up and, and redraw over it. 
Uh, but I mean, if there's something I really don't like, if the shoulder is like too close to the chin, you know, I can just get rid of that and do it again. But it's really just like fading and then re readjusting. And I love as you kind of draw this, and maybe this is a question for you. Uh, as you draw, are there ever characters that like, as you draw them, they like tell you more about their personality and you're like, oh, I have to change this detail and that detail. Because as you see them, you're like, oh man, it feels like they would actually wear this or do this. Does that ever inform your process? Yeah, I think so. I think it's kind of like that brainstorming we're doing where I'm I'm saying this story and sometimes I'll be like, oh, it'd be really cool. Like you said, with the, uh, if you had different mechanical arms for different situations and it's, it's nice when you have people to bounce off of it, but I'm kind of thinking through this process when I'm just drawing alone too. And uh, I think as I'm drawing them, the drawing kind of informs ideas and then the ideas kind of make their way into the drawing. And it's this back and forth visually and like writing wise, you know, kind of the writing portion and the, the drawing portion. And uh, usually by the time I'm done, you know, sketching the character, I have a pretty good idea of who they are. Yep. Uh, and Doc Reed, uh, also an amazing illustrator and is actually the guest, I believe, on Create Tips with Voodoo Val today, if you want to stick around for that. Uh, he says, I like Chunk, but Crank is also fun. I agree. Ooh. Crank is a really fun name. Crank is really good just because of that, those mechanical connotations. Yep. You know, he's got that arm and just the, the blacksmithing process. It seems to kind of work with that too. Yep, which is funny. There's a, I used to play League of Legends uh, back when I was a nerd. Uh, I played League <laughs> of Legends. I would always play a character named Blitzcrank. And his whole thing was that he would have a mechanical arm that he could like grab people with. So it is a proven great name. Uh, I love Crank. Yeah, Crank's good. I think, uh, I think Molly and Crank are solid. Now we haven't talked about the villain yeah. too much, but if anyone has ideas for that, yep, let me know. Steve. <laughs> Steve, yeah. Menacing. He he's so new to sorcery yes. and you're trying to get that reputation that he doesn't really have a cool name yet. Is yeah, yeah like you can't give Steve. yourself a nickname. And so he's like, I don't know, I'm just Steve. I'm just like waiting for somebody to like give me a villain name. But uh, chat, if you have a villain name or just a name for our villain, uh let us know. We can toss it in there. Ooh. It's so fun to just watch them come to life and you can start to imagine the scenarios and the scenes and especially like how they move, how they walk, how they'll like address problems. It's interesting that you can get all that just from using these shapes. And again, like developing the shape language that you're using is informing how I feel or experience these characters. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I was thinking I need to have some idea of this, this character before the stream today, because otherwise... You can spend, you know, hours just in that ideation phase uh, before you really settle on something. But um, I, I had like a whole idea of her personality to the point where I could picture it as if it was an animated, you know, show where like she's darting around, she's really quick and she's like getting overly excited about her idea that she just had. I feel like I'm taking some of these ideas from me for sure, because like that's relatable. Sometimes I'll have a project idea. I'm like, oh my God, and I could do this and that. Yep. Um, so pulling, pulling from bits of myself, I suppose. You just did something that I want to comment on that I know that Wade does actually. I, Wade was the first person that I saw do this. You just flipped your canvas. Why did you do that in the middle of your illustration process? I probably should have done it earlier, but flipping the canvas is definitely one of those habits that I think is very good to get in, um, to get doing frequently and to like get it into muscle memory. Because a lot of times I'll see this and I'll be like, all right, the just the composition of shapes is looking skewed. It's not quite where I want. So what I could do is like when you flip it, you see it with fresh eyes. Um, if something's leaning left and you're not really noticing it, maybe because you just have a tendency of drawing things leaning left. When you flip it to the complete opposite, your brain just notices a lot more like, whoa, that really, that's that's leaning right, you know, way too far. Yep. Um, so you kind of see it with fresh eyes. You see things if they're skewed more easily and um, it helps you transform it before you commit to anything. So I probably should have done it earlier. There's, it's really not bad because we're so early on in this, but I think she's leaning a bit too much. So I'm gonna go into transform, maybe skew and just lean her a little bit more that oh, way. Oh, that's so interesting. And I didn't notice that at all the other way. And then you flipped it and it's like, oh yeah, she does feel kind of leany and stretchy. Yeah, and then I'll flip it back just to make sure. Um, 
and see and she looks fine to me it's not like she's oh now she's looks like she's leaning this way too much because sometimes that happens but i think it looks it looks good now yep uh and chat has a great name for our villain monarch i love that now i feel like i want to give him butterfly uh uh motifs oh yeah like evil evil butterfly have there been any evil butterfly villains i guess like uh venture bros have that's like what i whole, was yeah yeah the monarch i was gonna say that sounds familiar yeah that's, and yeah that's someone a... in chat is saying drawing is so fun to watch i agree uh this is the equivalent of like watching a podcast for me uh and i love just leaving adobe live on uh, as i work because it's it really is like watching a podcast and you can get inspired you can learn new techniques and like stumble onto stuff like the flipping the artboards to see if everything is balanced yeah and now i'm thinking it might be fun to give her like a i don't know like if she has a, a tool that she uses or some sort of like i don't know if it would be a magical wrench or an enchanted wrench or something enchanted I feel wrench, like she, yes i feel like she should have a, a not a weapon but you know something that is sort of iconic for her so i don't i'll, I'll give her some sort of like wrench yep I and i, I love know. the like exaggeration especially in fantasy stuff of like objects being as big as the characters and it's like yep that's just what it is is like a wrench that is the <laughs> four foot wrench yeah and i picture her like using it right so it, maybe it's locked onto something here and she's just like hanging from it you know yes. trying trying to get the weight weight of her body to yank it down yep she's small so she's got a got to be resourceful yep and it's walking stick it like maybe can like shoot electricity or like powers or whatever like it's got it's got a, a lot of versatility there yeah even if it's something like somehow i don't know if she utilized some wizard magic or she just she's doing something with like you know power yeah you know, whatever fantasy electricity or, or something i always thought it would be kind of fun to mix fantasy elements of magic but technology you know like they kind Ooh, of work off each other yeah. Uh, and someone is saying, uh, Steve says, she calls it Lug. I love that. That like she's got a name <laughs> for the wrench. I'll put that down here. Yep. Yeah, that's perfect. That's interesting. And it's very, it's very like um, Thor Hammer vibes to where like maybe it's really heavy, but to her it's not because it has like, she has some kind of like electric current that magnetizes it to her hand or whatever. I think that's an interesting story piece. And I love the little patches or whatever those are, probably grenades or <laughs> tools thinking or something. Pouches. I'm thinking she's probably, oh, yeah, yeah. probably got all sorts of like, you know, tools that she carries around. And actually this is kind of something we could play with. Um, it, it's really sketchy. So it's hard to see until we blow her up, but Big, medium, small, that kind of visual hierarchy. I'm thinking about that as I do it. Like these shoulder pads are one of the bigger elements on her. But even with like bags, I could put sort of larger bag. She has some bigger tools in here and then we could have like smaller ones. So, you know, when I'm doing these designs, I'm always trying to think about like visual hierarchy and what, what we could do. Yep. Thinking maybe some like, she's really coming along like apron or thing that kind of hangs down maybe oh kinda that rounded feels very, edges. yeah fantasy yes and i think this is kind of where i'd want to be for the uh the thumbnail you know i might adjust some small proportions but this is the phase before i actually do the line drawing because this is you know we are doing lines here but it's just a uh, doodling essentially um and i find that when i spend time not trying to make the lines perfect and just doodling around. This is this pays off later when I'm doing the the line drawing because we can figure out all the big questions like what are the big elements of her design and yes, the details don't don't matter. We can do that once we're doing the finished stuff. But I think the big questions are all answered uh, right now. All right, so we got about ten minutes left. Where do we want to take this in the last ten minutes that we got? We could uh, we could design the villain out. Chat, let me know what you think. Or we All could... right, let's do that. It feels like everybody is like semi developed, and he's kind of mm -hmm. just there. Um, yeah. So yeah, let's let's develop him out a little bit. See what we can do. I'd say he's he seems the least kind of concrete in my mind. Like I don't really know what his deal is or what his you know personality is as much as the others. Yep, and it looks like Chat agrees with us. 
Uh, and Doc Reed's asking, was that a keyboard shortcut or is that a transformation tool to flip the canvas? Oh, you just go up here. It's the little gear icon. And then you'll see view settings flip. You can flip vertically um, or horizontally. But so I just do this doc. little click, click. So I do that pretty frequently. Sweet. All right, let's hop in villain. Chat agrees that we should look at the villain. All right, let's do it. And I think at the end of this stream, I'd pretty much be at a point where, you know, I would take these in and I would start doing, blow them up, do more detailed lines, but also they look kind of cartoony, right? Like they look like they could be for a more stylized game. But the thing is, I can always change the proportions. Like I might draw him out in another document and do like a more actual, you know, kind of anatomy um, figure drawing type of build and then put clothes yep. on top of him. Right now I'm just doing it all together. But um, I, I might even change the style. It's just the idea is here. And I'm trying to make it as simple as I can because we're working, you know, big shapes and trying to keep it simple. So sometimes it looks more cartoony. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean these will be stylized. I can always make that decision later once I have the idea for the character down. And again, we just use the eraser tool there to kind of fade out those lines so that as you go in and draw in the darker lines, we can refine a little bit, get everything looking like really tight and clean uh, with an actual drawing. Yeah. And this is really like one of my favorite points because it's just so low pressure. I can just experiment. Like I'm trying to give them some sort of mask here. Ooh, yeah. Very, it almost feels very like, uh, in insecty the right that like they have like hmm. the thorax like the body parts that like kind of like plates connecting uh it has like that dimension that ooh i love this you can see i'm going really hard on the triangle on his face yep he's almost giving me like evil bunny vibes like instead <laughs> of it's being horns they're giving me like just big giant like sharp bunny ears that's funny we could always go the other direction with it too Got a, looks like Maleficent there a little bit. Yeah, it's it's fun to play with motifs like that too. Like, you know, why not give them an insect or, or rabbit motif? Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of like we were talking about with the monarch, um, you can just kind of play with those ideas. And Oh yeah, even with the face plates, it's got the kind of like butterfly-ish. Can give them sort of elfish ears because, you know, they're yeah. pointy, so why not? A lot of times the personality kind of comes from the face. So if I'm sketching the face out, it almost inspires more ideas for like, what is his personality? Yep. He feels very regal and like uh, stoic with this pose, which I think is interesting that he doesn't look like evil. He just looks again, like he's just stoic and he's like, I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah. And I would like to, even if we could play with that, like he does look kind of stoic and regal, but if we wanted to pursue that idea of like, He's trying to make a name for himself and he doesn't think he's taken seriously enough. Like how could we communicate like a little bit of insecurity or awkwardness? Yep. And sometimes you have to, you know, do a lot more of these designs. I'm doing one, one of each because we, we're limited on time, but a lot of times you'll do tons of these thumbnails, you know, depending on how much you really want to invest into the character. And, um, it's not always the first drawing, you know, that's that's the best. So it's it's good to do a lot of thumbnails and really explore all these different ideas. Like how could we make him look awkward or insecure? Would it be his posture, you know, his facial expression? There's all these different elements. Yep. Uh, and someone in chat is saying Hellboy is pretty cool. I agree, Hellboy is really cool. Uh, and with that, uh, Sam, are there any artists that like you reference or like, are inspired by constantly. I know that Mike Magnolia is like one of the ones that people are like, that's the style. Is there any artist or style that you just like are so inspired by constantly? Oh man, it's tough. Um, I know there's a lot of people who just like really great with character design. I feel like a lot of times with character design, I gravitate more towards uh, certain shows or games. Like I showed some characters from Overwatch just because I think their character design for that game was really fun. Yep. Um, Capcom characters, you know, they've had a lot of great designs. Uh, Piotr Jabłonski, I think I'm saying that right, <laughs> to the best of my ability. He's like my favorite painter, okay. uh, but he he doesn't necessarily, you know, do art that looks like mine, but I just love his like 
edge control and like his texture and the atmospheres he gets but um as far as like character design uh not as much comes to mind but i have a lot of painters who i really you know admire their ability and their style yep Ooh. trying, trying to, to think, think of the clothing that's happening yeah it's very like very like roby sharp yeah like overlapping kind of pieces of fabric but yeah which is interesting because that shape is kind of mirroring the sash uh that molly has that kind of like crossbody mm. ooh, and a little like wing element kind of arm flutter <laughs> yeah i'm thinking like kind of sleeve it could be sort of like a decorative you know sleeve that's hanging down yep i love Maybe. i love the complexity of this because it just like really sells that like he's trying really hard like <laughs> he's he's really trying to sell it guys you gotta dress for the job you want you know that's it that's it yeah he's like i want to be the best wizard there ever was if you're like well you're trying that's you're, you're really on your way buddy <laughs> it looks good but it needs more spikes if you want to be taken seriously yeah 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 love that love that spell slugger uh, <laughs> ace ace is always the one that drives me crazy if people are like way to go ace i'm like that's <laughs> it's such a weird thing to say i don't think i've ever been called ace i've been called boss quite a few times oh yeah boss is a good one uh it's steve is saying kimono slash wings yeah i think that that vibe is really cool and it does look very like butterfly -y with what you're doing with that lower part it feels very much like the back end of a butterfly with like the kind of segments that piece together mm-hmm Oh, and for, for his uh, leggings, like we could even do, or his boots, you know, we could even go really angular with these, like have them kind of be these sharp triangles. Ooh. So you can just go, you know, you can really just play around with all the, the shape motif that you've chosen. And you can mix it with other ones too, but we'll go, we'll give them like a sharp sort of gauntlet situation too. Gauntlet. I was just playing Gauntlet last night. <laughs> Little throwback. Uh, so. Chat, what are some of your favorite character designs that are maybe memorable, uh, even if they're like super niche? Uh, what character designs do you remember stuck in your brain? For me, and this is a very niche one, uh, it's Hex from uh, uh, Fern Gully. He's Ooh. basically like this cloud of smoke that like represents pollution but the way that they like animate him is very like oily and like uh amorphous kind of just blobs and so you can get really great facial expressions that are like exaggerated and uh just really have a lot of personality so that's that's one of my favorites because he just kind of evolves into this cohesive character that also can be like any character uh chat let us know what what uh mem memoric what <laughs> what what um memorable memorable there we go what memorable character designs have you seen do you have one that pops in your brain sam man there's just so many like yep. i think some of those that i i grabbed you know like pixar disney i mean those ones definitely stand out i have a lot of video games i grew up with where there's some iconic ones but it is interesting to think back like which ones pop out in your mind a lot of times, you know, there's a reason that uh, my character felt iconic, but yep, yeah, I totally remember Fern Gully with that one. I think that scared me as a kid. Oh, yeah. Uh, someone says Wally. Yeah, Wally is such a good design. So I think this is about all I can get done for this guy with the time we have, but I yep. think uh, this would give me a really good, you know, jumping off point to take these characters to the next level. Yeah, and I think that we've developed, again, we got story, we got visual language, uh, and I love the presentation that you gave to kind of help us understand that. So if you want to go back, you can always rewatch this. It will be here on Adobe Live's YouTube forever. Uh, so you can go back, kind of get the idea. And these are the characters that we created. We got Molly, Crank, and Steve uh, in those different shades, the circular, the rectangular, and that awesome sharpness. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. Stick around. Create Tips is up next, next with our friend Doc Reed. Uh, Sam, any parting words for our audience? uh yeah just have fun with these you know play around with cast of characters and play around with shape and and see the variety you can get between them it's uh it's a lot of fun to come up with stories surrounding that too
yes, go have fun. And we'll see you all another time here on Adobe Live. Bye. Thanks, everybody.